Hey everybody, this is Andrea Change from the Guild Complex. Welcome. Uh, tonight, with the help of Make Magazine's Lit and Lose Book Club, we welcome Luis J. Rodriguez and uh, Luis Tubins, who will be discussing his newest book, From Our Land to Our Land. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Louis Tubins, a.k.a. Logan Lou, who was born in Chicago's West Town neighborhood and raised in Logan Square. Uh, in 2014, he earned a BA in Communications Media Theater from Northeastern University and Northeastern Illinois, I should say. Louis has performed poetry across the United States, if you haven't heard, including with the Guild Complex. It's part of Tia Chucha Press and the National Museum of Mexican Art. He's toured Mexico City in 2016 and 2018 and presented in the work of the acclaimed show Socrates Mix in 2016 and also at the National Book Fair of Lyon uh, and featured in Puerto Rico at Poets Passage and Gatherings of Cities in um, and Libros AC in 2019. He's a 2017 artist in residence at Oak Park Public Library and also held workshops for residents of the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center and students in the Chicago Public Schools. On stage, he is open for notable acts, including Saul Williams and Calais 13. He represented Chicago in the 2014 and 2018 National Poet Poetry Slam. He's the author of Stone Eagle, published in 2017. And currently, Louis is the resident poet of SO Funk, Best New Band, and Best International Music Act 2016 from the Chicago Reader. Welcome, Louis Tubins. Take it away. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, hello, everybody out there in virtual land. And thank you for joining us today on this interview with Luis Rodriguez. Um, so uh, Luis uh, uh, Rodriguez, for anybody out there who uh, hasn't, hasn't heard of this great poet, is a phenomenal uh, literary artist that has also worked in the social justice realm just as much as in the literary realm. Um, and you're going to see that through his poetry. You're going to hear it through his voice. Um, but um, I think we'll go ahead and uh, and get started with the award-winning recent poet laureate um, Luis Rodriguez uh, and his new book, From Our Land to Our Land. Luis, how you doing? I'm doing great, brother. Great to be here. Give a shout out to all my family and friends in Chicago and all over, whoever's here. Hey, much love. Much appreciated for that. Uh, so if we could start off with the title, From Our Land to Our Land. Um, what, why did you decide to title your, your most recent book this? Well, you know, as you know, when, when Trump became president, um, all this white supremacy came out. And I was doing a reading that same year that he got uh, elected. And mm -hmm. um, this white guy screaming and yelling. There was like 400 people coming in, all brown people, yelling and mm -hmm. screaming at him. You know, you Mexicans, you steal our jobs, you're no good. You know, he was just going crazy. So they told me, hey, man, you want us to beat him up? <laughs> you know, I said, the students, I said, no, I said, don't do nothing. Man. Just leave him alone, man. Just, they yeah. called the security. I said, listen, tell him what. I tell you what, let's bring him inside. If he doesn't cause some ruckus, well, if he does, we'll handle it. But mm. bring him inside and let him hear. So I wanted to tell him and all of America, I am not an immigrant. Mm -hmm. My mother is Tarumara, which in mm. Mexico, it's a very important tribe in Chihuahua, Mexico. The Tarumaras are uh, related to the Pueblo, to the Hopi, to mm. the Shoshone, the Paiute, all these tribes. They're part of that, except for the border that came in when a hundred and some years ago comes in and now we don't, now we're divided. Now we don't see our relations. But my, the reason why I say from our land to our land, we lived in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Mm -hmm. When my mother went across the international bridge, mm. had me born in El Paso, Texas. But the Chihuahua desert goes through Chihuahua and part of El Paso and part of New Mexico. Mm. So this is why I say the Tarumar have been there at least 10,000 years. Mm. This is why I say we went from our land to our land. Wow, that is beautiful. Um, you know, that is uh, um, a story that, um, that I think many people try to express about, you know, um, how how borders are man-made, at least these politicized yeah. borders, um, how our people have crossed over um, from different areas and have been been in areas for for generations, uh, for years. So um, the the book um, from our land to our land, um, you you really go through many of uh, of your experiences, and one of the experiences that uh, that you bring up here is about um, your, your time here in uh, in Chicago, um, and uh, when you uh, 
you know, we're, we're, the Guild Complex out, out here in Chicago. Um, I'm sure a lot of people out there are going to want to learn about your, your, your Chicago connection here, um, which not only just included uh, in the literary realm, there's a lot of, of work you did on the streets here in the city too, no? Yeah, so Chicago, I lived there 15 years, 85 to the year 2000. I fell in Chicago right at the beginning of the slam, poetry slam, mm. scene, which was born there. A lot of people don't even know that. I keep telling people the slams were born in Chicago. <laughs> and so it was yeah. good because eventually uh, we started, I was one of the co-founders of the Guild Complex, mm -hmm. which became instrumental in that whole period of this, not, not just slams, but poems, poetry, poetry, and music, poetry with, you know, and the beaches, poetry. I mean, the way that mm -hmm. Chicago likes to do things. And so I was very much part of it. And Thea Chucha Press started over 30 years ago in Chicago. Mm. So I was very active there. But I also mm -hmm. got involved working with the homeless. I worked with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, and my good friend, uh, uh, John Donahue, used to be there. He's he passed. He's a great, great guy. Mm -hmm. And then I also went to prisons, went to juvenile facilities, went to the Audi Home, which is the juvenile center. Yep. For years I was going there. And then my own son, as uh, the story goes, was always running. He joined a gang there in Humboldt Park, mm. and um, I, I didn't want him in no gang because, you know, my story, I was a gang member. I was on uh, heroin and other drugs for seven years. I was in and out of jail, juvenile hall with a few dope facilities. I'm formerly incarcerated. I didn't want my son in there, but sure enough, he got active there in mm -hmm. Humboldt Park. He got in and out of trouble. He ended up going to prison uh, for about a year and a half of different things, and then, unfortunately, at age 21, when I thought he was done with it all, he got uh, convicted and sentenced to 28 years in the Illinois prison system. So my work up to that point was to work with young people. I mm. did a lot of work. Uh, Increase the Peace Network was a mm. major, you know, coming together of gang intervention, gang intervention uh, specialists throughout Chicago. We had like 12 communities we worked with. And then also I, I helped start the uh, Youth Struggling for Survival, which was working in, um, you know, Humboldt Park and Logan Square and Uptown and, uh, Pilsen, Little Village. Uh, we even have people from Aurora. We yeah. were, you know, we were working with a lot of people in mm -hmm. gangs, helping kids, mentoring them, teaching them, bringing healing, bringing um, the Native Indigenous cosmology. Because we had sweat lodges. We did a lot of amazing work there in Chicago that I know was pioneering at the time. And uh, now people are talking, talking this stuff, restorative justice, all these things. Mm -hmm. Now even begin to talk about it. Yeah, you know, you're you're coming from LA, you're going to Chicago, two, uh, and then you're going back in, 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 to LA, uh, two cities um, that have a, a major gang culture, um, especially amongst Black and Brown youth. Um, what are some of the similarities that you saw between the the Chicago gang youth and, and the and the LA gang youth, uh, and as to the reasons why they started getting involved uh, in these gangs and in drugs and and in that life? So my analysis, uh, I hope people can understand what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. the, two, the, two, the two things that make Chicago and L.A. similar, even though mm -hmm. they're two different cities, they look different, they have different histories, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the two things they, they have, one is they have industry. Mm -hmm. Both Chicago and L.A. were the two industrial centers in the country. People don't think about L.A. that way, but it was. Mm -hmm. uh, people know I worked in steel mills, worked in, I worked in auto plants. I worked in all kinds of factories and foundries. People think it was Chicago I was working at. I go, no, I did that work in L.A. And just like L.A., Chicago got hit hard with deindustrialization. Mm -hmm. As you know, all the steel mills went down, the, the, the back of the yards, all the stockyards, yep. a lot of industry went down, and it hit L.A. the same way. Uh, in L.A., by 1984, 300 factories, foundries, and you know, refineries shut down. This impacted our communities. Black and brown, because we were beginning to enter that industrial world and beginning to open up into the more well-paid, skilled crafts. You know, we're just beginning. We're mm. beginning to get going, and then all of a sudden, the rug gets pulled from under us. Mm. So you can imagine gangs who have been around Chicago and in LA for a while now become, in some cases, the most cohesive way to make a living. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, drugs yeah. comes in, drug, guns come in. And we know that that didn't come in from us, you know, mm -hmm. but somehow drugs and guns came in around the 80s, cracks started coming through, all these things. And gangs were the best way to get them organized, get out there and uh, sell, make a living. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think we got hit by the same thing, deindustrialization, and then the, the guns and drugs come in the way it did. And uh, 
the LA gangs and Chicago gangs are now the two main gangs around the country. You know, everybody's got gangs. But as you know, LA gangs, Chicago gangs are the ones that have been spread out uh, uh, pretty widely. Yeah. Wow. Um, so you're, you're there, you're working with gangs, you, you, um, you see everything what's going on, but then there's this other side of your world where you're writing poems, you're writing great literary works uh, about these, these experiences. How were you able to, to balance that social justice life with that literary life? Um, because you know, the, the, I would imagine that these are, these are two different skill sets, uh, mm. and you're, you're having to, you're having to do these at, at the same time, almost, you know, mutually, uh, uh, growing in both fields. Well, you know, I think it came out of the sixties because in the sixties, I grew up during the sixties, the mm-hmm. civil rights, the black Panther movement, the Brown Berets, mm-hmm. the, uh, the young Lords, all these movements had poets, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? In other words, yeah. it wasn't really strange for people active in social justice to also do art. Do murals, as you know, murals got really big in Chicago. Yeah, got big in LA and all these cities. In other words, yeah. art, music, and poetry was integral to movements. Always, mm-hmm. we might have lost some of that in the in intervening years, but I think like today, I'm seeing it come back mm-hmm. the same way. Now people are out there, they're marching, they're protesting, but there's also a lot of art. There's music. Mm-hmm. I hear a lot of poetry. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's integrated again to movements. So I feel that that's why it was. It wasn't a big conflict for me. I could mm-hmm. do both because now my poetry, my language could carry the struggle of the streets mm-hmm. and uh, the struggle of the people. And I love that part of it. So I was never one of these poets that could say, hey, I don't have anything to do with politics or with, you know, yeah. change or nothing. Mm-hmm. No, hey, man, it's it's interwoven with <laughs> everything that I do. Luis, uh, would you please uh, grace us with a poem uh, from your new book? From our land to our land. So what I want to do, and I want to also read a poem to LA, but at that I would read a poem uh, about Los Angeles here, um, just because LA and Chicago again are both my homes. Uh, I have a daughter, my beautiful daughter Andrea, who's also named Andrea, is in Chicago, and my grandkids, four of my five grandkids are in the Chicago or Illinois. I have four great grandkids in Illinois. So in honor of them, but I do want to read this poem to L.A. Um, it actually started as a poem. I made it prose in the book, but it's, it gives you a little sense of L.A. And then maybe later, but later I'll read a poem that I wrote for Chicago. This, is, this goes like this. Los Angeles is where Santa Ana winds scatter dry leaves and droughts make tinder out of the formerly green brush, where wildfires are metaphor and reality for our eternal and external terrains, where the city is music, but also muscles, a ran dance, often with no rain, neon glared, smog tent skyline, held together in a spider web of freeways. It's a place where even jacarandas and palm trees are transplants. This is where the city's buildings are bricked and nailed together with survival stories, war stories, and love stories. The kind of harrowing accounts Los Angeles of pearls at 3 a.m. when ghosts meander along the upturned pavement or rumble by on vintage cars, and all-night diners convert into summits for the played-out, heartsick, and suicidal. There's a migrant soul in this rooted city, skid row next to the Diamond District, waves of foam against barnacled piers, cafes and boutiques next to botanicas, ravines and gullies turn into barrios, rustic homes with gardens, dot, leak cityscapes, and suburbs burst with world-class graffiti. Fragmented yet cohesive, Los Angeles demands reflection on ourselves and the unstable ground we call home, where people die for lack of roof or food or compassion. As renowned LA writer John Fonte would say, these persons are songs over sidewalks, imaginations on the interchange, humanity that deserves connections, touch, breath. These roads, bridges, and alleys also contain concertos, Breezes over the ocean's darkest depths are replete with harmonies, and a howling moon and red sunset serve as backdrop for every aching interlude. Los Angeles is where every step rhymes, where languages flit off tongues like bowls across strings. Skateboarders and aerosol spray cans clatter in a daily percussion, and even angels intone, we can do better, we can do better, 
while haggling at garage sales. Wow. That was, uh, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I love the way that you're able to show this, this, um, this yin and yang of Los Angeles where you bring us through the, the beauty and the glimpses yeah. of it. Um, yeah. but then of all the, of, of, um, uh, of all the bad things that, that go down, all the things that we yeah. see in that city life. Um, yeah. you know, I, yeah, people, people should know real quickly, LA is one of the richest cities in the world. Mm -hmm. There's 60 billionaires in LA, but what they also should know, it is one of the poorest communities in the world. There's mm -hmm. 60,000 people living in the streets. That to me tells you what capitalism is all about. That tells you the story. Great success, nice buildings, skyline, but also mm -hmm. so many people who have nowhere to go. So yeah, so that that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you mentioned something that, that capitalism brings, and there, there's an issue that is affecting Los Angeles that also is affecting Chicago, uh, gentrification. Um, okay. And um, I know that you, in addition to doing the literary arts, you did some murals too, did you not? Um, I sure did. Yeah, okay. and, and we, we've seen that in a very visual way how um, the relationship between murals and gentrification um, is happening right now. It's almost like a, a, a different kind of, uh, of violence. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that, you know, you as a muralist through, through the artist's eyes, but also you as a poet um, uh, observe in L.A. Um, and what are, your, what are your feelings on that? So, yeah, you know, um, L.A. and Chicago are also known for the murals. The mm -hmm. two cities that have had a great mural movement in the 60s. I was a graffiti artist, but it was all gang related. You know how it is, but it wasn't mm -hmm. tagging. It was very intricate. And then somebody said, why don't you become an artist? I had a mentor who tried to guide me from the gang life into a life mm -hmm. of being an artist, a writer, into being an activist. And um, so at 17, believe it or not, when I had already dropped out of high school, hmm. he got me a job painting murals with 13 gang kids. This was a long time ago. This is 50 years ago. And the murals are, were amazing. They were be beautiful. I had, a, I had to sketch them out. We had to put them on charts. We had to put them on, you know, the lines where you have to, um, you know, make sure you can put them on the wall. And, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's all beautifully done. And the murals were really important. But as you point out, unfortunately, eventually those neighborhoods uh, began to gentrify. My neighborhood was the poorest neighborhood in L.A. County at the time I lived there. Hmm. The poorest dirt roads. It looked like Appalachia or the South, only it was denser. Uh, little shacks, goats and chickens in people's backyard. That's what Watts used to look like. That's what these mm -hmm. uh, LA barrios were like, these rural ghetto type places. But right now, it's McMansions, it's mm -hmm. townhouses. They've got mm -hmm. rid of the body of people, they got rid of the poor people. And so uh, that's what I saw in Chicago as well. As you know, I grew up in, I grew up, I spent a lot of time in Humboldt Park. Humboldt Park, where I was there, was Barrio, was Gente, was, man, uh, mostly Puerto Rican. We had a great neighborhood. There were black parties, you know how Chicago is. We had a great time there. And now, if you go to that same area where I lived at, it's all uh, townhouses. It's all three-story flat condos. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like completely been changed. And the people, our Gente, have been pushed out. That's what I don't like about it. I mean, it, to improve the communities is fine. Mm -hmm. But keep the communities intact. That's what they don't do. They push people out. So that's what you're seeing everywhere. And uh, and I hate that any art mm -hmm. might be the catalyst for some of that. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep doing our art, but I know how it worked out. Where once the artist spoke up, got on the walls, made things beautiful, all of a sudden people said, hey, maybe I want to live here. People with money. Mm -hmm. And then they throw out all the poor people out. Yeah, that seems to be like the crux of the problem. Like how do we figure that out? Because we want improvements. And by we, I mean, you know, our people that are in these communities that um, are not, are not uh, having resources um, being placed in them as much as other areas of a city. But, um, and, and then we, we make it better, right? We ourselves, we yeah. make the art. Uh, and then we don't find ourselves there to enjoy it. Um, yeah. I think that that's, yeah, I, I totally... Totally well, it has to do with power, man, because you know what? The poor communities, either in Chicago, wherever, all over the country, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the power, man. We don't, we're not the owners of these buildings. Mm -hmm. We're not the owners of the streets. We don't have the policymakers that we wish we had. I mean, it might be getting slightly better, but for the most part, we don't. So guess mm -hmm. what? The developers, the big developers, mm -hmm. the big money comes in. They dictate what's going to happen. So this is why I like what people are saying. Uh, 
get your knee off our neck. Mm. Give us the power to control our communities. Mm -hmm. Give it to us. We'll rebuild our cities. We'll paint art, but we'll also we'll do beautiful buildings. We'll do parks. You know, I know that if um, like uh, Pasel Boricua, you know, yes. was put that way, so it wouldn't be losing itself and would be developed with the hands of the, the gente. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's what you need to do all over the place. But again, that's hard because people with money and power rule in this country. That's just the re reality we have to be aware of mm -hmm. and try to do whatever we can to change it. But every time we try to make changes, guess what? That boot is on our neck and we can't seem to get out of the paralysis that we're in and the stagnation that we end up in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's almost like we're always being chased um, or uh, we're always running. Oh yeah, I'm always <laughs> running. There you go. You know, I, <laughs> I know, I know. We're here to talk about your new book. I do, I do want to give a, a couple of friends of mine asked me to give you a shout out specifically because they read that book when when they were younger, uh, and it, it really sparked something in them. Um, so you know, I, I, I'm not sure if it's like this uh, in other in, in LA as well, but for some reason, Chicago specifically, uh, mm -hmm. always running is very popular with, amongst everybody I talked about. As soon you as I said. It, it happened because I was living in Chicago at the time and because I brought in Chicago Humble Park in the mm -hmm. book. I brought in because my son, it was, the catalyst was my son joining a mm -hmm. gang there. And I was trying to save him. And that opened the story to my story. Mm -hmm. You know, because now there's a, you know, my dad was a, a formerly incarcerated guy in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was formerly incarcerated. And then my son gets, but he gets really hit hard. He ended up doing a total of 15 years in prison. Uh, that's three generations. You know what I'm saying? There's mm -hmm. got to be a stop to that. I didn't want to mm -hmm. see my son, my own son, who, when I had him, I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I was so transformed by holding him, him and my daughter. And there, she came in two years later. These babies saved me, but I couldn't save them. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It's really sad. And so that's part of the story that I know people in Chicago can relate to because mm -hmm. I, once the book came out, this is 27 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I went all over Chicago, man. I was doors were open. I spoke to every major high school. I went to uh, all, all the juvenile facilities with all their universities and colleges. Yeah. The Chicago area, Illinois, I was all over the place. And as you might have known, the book got uh, banned in some places. Mm -hmm. And in Rockford, it was a big battle. I went out <laughs> there to battle Rockford yeah. around my book. And, and not because I think everybody should read the book. My attitude was we need more reality in our classrooms. The kids mm -hmm. were saying, hey, man, I don't get books like this. That's why the book was meaningful. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, there's reality. Here's something that we don't get in the classroom. Mm -hmm. They have a fantasy world they want to feed us. One lie after another, one doozy mm -hmm. after another. And somebody come up with a book. I'm not the only one, but obviously people come up with books and say, here's reality. Mm -hmm. And you can learn from reality. I'm not saying here's reality and that's the way it should be. I'm saying learn from it so you can rise up and struggle and get organized and be the leader you need to be to change those conditions. Yeah, and that was a pretty uh, monumental battle because that marks one of the first times that uh, a Latinx writer um, had their had their books banned, uh, at least in Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was very monumental. One thing I will say uh, in school, I mean, libraries around the country, mostly in California, they tell me it's one of the most checked out books. But here's one thing they tell me <laughs> that I really love. It's one of the most stolen books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's cool. If you're going to steal yeah, something, man. steal book, steal my book. That's hey, cool, man. You know? You know? Not, I'm not encouraging nobody. And you know, don't, you don't say, hey, I told yeah. you to steal my book. But that's, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that is actually awesome because... You know, you really got to care about something if you're going to steal it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you really, you really got to want that thing um, to risk, you know, punishment um, for, for that. You know, that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, now, uh, getting back to your book, From Our Land to Our Land, uh, could, you, could you give us a, a, another taste? Absolutely. Please. So, um, one of the things that I, I, I write about many things, but one of the most important things was uh, all the work that I did working in prisons. And mm -hmm. I actually have been doing it for 40 years. Um, and I, again, Chicago, I went to prisons all over the state and did a lot of work there, even the prisons that my son ended up in. You know, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of sad that you go to prison, your own son is in these prisons. Mm -hmm. But I want to um, read this one section from this essay that's called Monsters of Our Own Making. And what I'm saying is that these gang kids that we call monsters, that they're the worst of the worst, they're terrible, we can't do nothing with them. 
look at, they're made in an oven of oppression, suppression, of lack of resources. They're made in an oven of poverty. I mean, you know, uh, in other words, let's be real about what we're dealing with. I'm not saying that people can't change and that people can't take personal responsibility, but I think you can't do personal responsibility and that you also address the social responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read you this one poem that starts the thing, um, the essay. It's by a, a poet who I know named Jimmy McMillan, uh, an Oakland kid who's still incarcerated in California State Prison, and it goes like this. I can't see him coming down my eye, so I had to make this poem cry, this pen bleed, this paper scream with emotions, with hopes it makes us free. And so let me just read the one, the beginning section of this particular essay. A lifer stood up to read his writing. After 15 weeks of sitting in a creative writing class, I facilitated at a classroom at a maximum security yard of Lancaster State Prison. It was our last day of that session. I had just passed on completion certificates and was about to share juice and cake the prison, ki the prison kitchen staff had brought us. The 40-something-year-old man hadn't said much during the previous weeks. He didn't seem to be writing either. I had noticed this, but it didn't bother me. The class was lively with a flow of ideas and expressions. Most of the guys were serving life sentences, some without the possibility of parole. I always felt people could listen in their own way. Seeds were being planted. And if someone kept coming to class, I kept teaching. But now this man stood up and read, opened up his heart about how ever since he could remember, he had been abused, how drugs took his parents away from him, how he bounced around in the foster care system, juvenile detention centers, and prison, and how being callous, a predator, had given him power, identity, a way of getting back. But he also related how lost he had become detached, not fully human. His words were not a litany of excuses or complaints. They were recognition of terrible choices he'd made in a world of limited choices, of the fears and paralysis that impelled him to diminish his true callings. This OG, who was African-American, didn't care how he would perceive it at that moment. Tears began to fall from his eyes, even as his voice remained strong. We were all riveted crying tears inside, if not on the outside. The men's silence was the best mark of respect he could have received. When he was done, the quiet lingered for a beat. Then the applause rushed in. The men were visibly moved as this man stood poised, unwavering in the world of dark and convoluted sentiments. This and similar moments have made my work in prisons some of the most healing and sacred anywhere. So I want people to understand having worked in prisons this long, I see the humanity that we sometimes don't want to see, that we want to crush, push away. I get that's hardcore people in there. I get that there's people that need a lot of work, but what I can't stand and what the world is now challenging, the whole mass incarceration system has to go. It does not work. It does not work to punish out the pain that some of these young people have been through. We have to bring in real healing into uh, these uh, young men and women caught up in that world. We have to bring a real treatment. We have to bring a real habilitation, real training, real give them real tools so they in fact can save themselves. And that's really my message. And I, I have this essay to make that whole case. Because I've gone to prisons um, all over the US, like 20 states, up and down the state of California, I've been invited to do prisons in Mexico, in uh, El Salvador, to um, Nicaragua, to Guatemala. I did an abandoned uh, girl shelter teaching poetry for a month in Honduras. I also spent time in five prisons in Argentina and then did even was invited to a prison in England and worked with youth offenders in Italy, if you can imagine. So it's becoming, I'm getting renowned around the world for this work because again, now everybody's coming to, together to reimagine the whole thing. And I'm saying again, like I said then, like I said, even 40, 50 years ago, that's not the way to deal with the trouble in our youth and our communities. We have other ways to go, and that's what I'm asking people to do. We imagine it so we can go the most healing, most connected, most human way we can go possible. Wow, that's amazing. Um, you know, you you with your work that you're doing in prisons, obviously it's coming from a, a place because you, you know the experience of being in a prison and you know that system. But 
as you work with uh, 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 prisons from uh, different parts of the world, what are some of the common features, the common things that you see happening in these prisons um, that, um, that, 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 is, that is driving um, the, the population up of people having to go to prisons? Well, you know, it's, it's poverty is number one, man. It's getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, poverty, no jobs, nothing to do. And then uh, what happened, like, for example, I was in El Salvador for several years, and I went there um, and did, I went to 10 prisons in El Salvador. And when you're in a place like El Salvador, there's literally nothing for nobody to do, forget gang members. But here's what happened this government started to do. A lot of these Salvadorian refugees, they ended up in L.A., their kids became gang members. They joined mm -hmm. Chicano gangs, basically. Wow. They became part of the Chicano gang structure, and they started their own gang. Uh, the most famous one is MS-13 that everybody talks about. But just so people put it in perspective, MS-13 is only one of 500 gangs in L.A., Latino, Latinx gangs. You know what I'm saying? In yeah. other words, it's only one of 500. They're not the worst. They're not the, the lightweights. They're, all, they're just one of 500. They're making a big deal out of them. But they also deported them to El Salvador. They deported this tattooed face. Um, Cholo eyes, you know, Cholo kind of gangs uh, at Valley down there and uh, highly sophisticated trained by the prison, the Chicano prison gangs in California. And now these countries have been paying a big price hmm. for almost 30 years. The violence, the extortions, it's just it's phenomenal. They've actually killed more people during this period than during the Civil War. Wow. That's how bad it's been. And now we are, should, should take responsibility because we deported these people. We deported them when we should have done it. We should have helped them. We should have gave them tools, whatever we needed. We sent them down there, and then we're crying about all the violence. And then, of course, some of them are coming back. Not that many. Some are coming back, and we're making mm -hmm. now MS-13 the first transnational gang to go after. But I look at it as just because they're trying to see immigrants as the worst of the worst. Hmm. You know, they're using MS-13 to attack every immigrant community from all over. So... I, I tell people that because I was in those prisons. I was with MS-13. I was with the other gangs there. I worked with these people. And, you know, this, they're still amazing human beings. I hope I can make that clear, you know. <laughs> and I've been in prisons where there's, like, a room for maybe a couple guys like their cells that we have in, in Illinois or anywhere in the U.S. They have 20 guys in those cells for years. They're living in hammocks hung from the ceilings on every part of the floor. You're talking about some really terrible. There's prisons where no water, no portable water, no electricity. Wow. So when it gets dark, everything's dark. You got prisons where women have to have their babies with them because there's nobody to take care of them. So their babies are in prison with them. And there's babies in Mexico, I've seen this, and in, in Central America that have been in prison since they were babies and now they're grown up. They, they grew up in prisons. There was a prison in Mexico that were going to shut down because it was so overcrowded. Uh, it's, it, it was supposed to hold like, I don't know, 600 people and they had like 7,000. So the government went in to shut it down. And there was these people with, with, um, teddy bears on the, on saying, don't take away our home. Can you imagine people who grew up this way? People don't know what it's like in these countries, you know, so things are terrible here and I'm against what's happening here, but I'm telling you, man, you go to Mexico, Central America, you're going to find the terrible stark reality of prisons unlike anything most people could, could even think about. Wow. You know, and we see that, too, as, as, as one of the results of something that you mentioned earlier about the failed um, promises of, of capitalism um, and, what it, and what it does, because uh, many of these prisons uh, is, is in their, their, their profit uh, business to, to make sure that there's people that are keeping it housed. You know, that's a very important point because a lot of these prisons are private industry. And I'm going to tell you, I've been there, too. They're worse than the other ones because every prisoner is a profit, and they want to minimize putting money in their uh, in, in in their health and in their prosperity or in their treatment. You know, they minimize it because it's a profit making thing. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. and even the guards, believe it or not, I talked to some guards. They can't stand working for these private industries. Mm -hmm. It's really funny because some of these guards were like hard, they were hard nosed. But I started talking to them. Because I, I, I'm also a journalist, so I was doing some stories out of these uh, mm -hmm. uh, private detention centers, and these guards were complaining. They said, "Man, I, I almost feel like going back to private, a public prison because these people treat you badly." You know, hey, it's a <laughs> proper business. What do you expect? Wow. So yeah. yeah. Wow, that's. Um, Luis, can we can we switch gears though here a little bit? Um, there is a, a couple of questions I actually have been dying to ask you. 
Um, and, and this is going to be uh, apart from any of your social justice work and, and focusing more on the, uh, on the literary um, work. Um, this new phenomenon of using the word Latinx. Mm-hmm. Um, you have people against it. You have people for it. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, some that are against it say, you know, it, it, it probably more excludes than includes. Uh, and those that are for it may say, you know, this is a way to have a, you know, a genderless way so that everybody could be equal in their in the representation. Yeah. Um, and you even use it here. Um, yeah. Chicanex, right? Um, what do so, you- so, so let me just say, you know, I don't use it to get anybody to want to use it. I don't want to be politically correct. This is the right thing to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. use it for myself because here's the thing. Almost all of those names are made up. Mm. Are we really Hispanics? Mm-hmm. That's people from Spain, really. Yeah. Are we really Latin when we've got African in us? When mm-hmm. we got Spanish? Yes, we do. And we got that indigenous. Puerto Rico, the Taino, the Mexicans mm-hmm. got all kinds of tribal people. You know what I'm saying? In other words, it's really a misnomers that they've given us. So my thing is, let me call myself what I want to call myself. Mm -hmm. That's me. I might as well say whatever I can. Now, here's the thing. I do a lot of work in the indigenous communities here in the U.S., Mm -hmm. Native American, and also indigenous from Mexico, Central America. Uh, My teachers, my elders are Lakota, they're Navajo, Dene, they're also from Mexico, they're Mexica, they're they're from the Pipin and El Salvador. I got Mayan teachers in Mexico and Guatemala. I even got teachers in uh, Peru. I learned from these great Mm -hmm. teachers. This connects me to my roots. What are you going to call a person like me? Mm -hmm. I don't belong in any, I belong everywhere, even though there's places that when people look at me, call me a stranger, a foreigner. Mm -hmm. You know, they say I'm an alien. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So are you kidding me? I belong because my family has been here, like I said, tens of thousands of years. How can you even put that label on me? But they do. So what I'm challenging is people to say, hey, listen. We don't have to take anybody else calling. Call yourself what you want to call yourself. Yeah. That, that Latinx to me and Chicanx is also trying to be inclusive of something that we had not thought of before, that there are fluid uh, trans people. So you know what I'm saying? There's uh, queer communities that don't quite fit into those categories. And it's just to be inclusive of all that. That's really what that is, mm-hmm. just to make sure that we're inclusive of everybody, you know, men, women, trans the fluidity of all these things that I think it's in our communities. And so that's why I want want to say that. But again, I'm not trying to get anybody to go along with it. You know, I'm not trying to push it next year. Maybe it'll be a different name, but I just think you're not getting any, any, uh, any endorsements off of it or anything like that. Are you? No, no. no. And the idea is that we are people who've been uh, some of the most rooted people. And yet we're probably the ones that are most feeling more uprooted than Mm -hmm. almost anybody. If mm-hmm. they can put indigenous native peoples in cages on the border, then you know that everything's been turned on its head. Mm, yeah. You know, th- this work that you do, uh, you go out to different places and do this work, whether it's you know, universities and colleges or, or in the prisons. But you also uh, founded a center um, where mm-hmm. people can come and they can express. Tia Chucha Press. Uh, I actually had the the honor and the pleasure of visiting uh, Tia Chucha when I was uh, when I was in uh, in LA, and I, as a matter of fact, uh, released my uh, my first book there. Um, I was on tour with uh, with the band uh, So Funk, and as we're you know going through California, um, my book um, finally um, you know shows up, uh, and uh, we were able to ship it to LA, and you were gracious enough to host uh, with the. The Atucha Press was gracious enough to host uh, the uh, the opening of uh, of that, so that has a, a, a warm sp- uh, place in my heart, and yeah. I, I know that it has a warm place in many people's hearts. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the? So, At- yeah, because it definitely has a Chicago uh, legacy. It started in Chicago over thirty years ago. I started it to just do my book. I, nobody was publishing Luis Rodriguez. You know what I'm saying? I sent out my poetry. Nobody was poetry. So I said, I'm going to do it myself. I actually was working in the publishing world. I was working for the Archdiocese of Chicago mm-hmm. in the publishing department. And I was typesetting. So I typeset my own book. Uh, I did it after hours, you know. And even the boss says, oh, you can do it, but do it outside the hours. I, I did. I was there. I put out this beautiful book. The designer worked for the, uh, the same company, and she's been my designer ever since, Jane Burnett. She's, out, she's from Chicago, but she mm. grew up in, in Wisconsin. She's part Menominee, Native, but also German and French. And we've been friends ever since. She's designed all my books. Anyway, I didn't start off 
trying to publish other people. But what happened, as soon as my book came out, it was called Poems Across the Payment. All these, especially the slam poets, were coming at me. Can you publish my book? And so I published <laughs> some of the most amazing people. Patricia Smith's mm-hmm. first book. Mm-hmm. I published um, um, uh, David Hernandez. Who you and me were talking another time about David Hernandez. Yeah, Puerto yeah. Puerto Rican powerhouse of poetry and music mm-hmm. and a great human being. We published his first book. We published Michael War, who was the visionary founder, you know, leader of Gil Complex. Um, and uh, and I can name Tony Fitzpatrick, a great artist and important uh, person in uh, in Chicago. Uh, but we also started publishing people from all over the country. Terrence Hayes' first book was published through us. Uh, uh, Patricia Spears Jones, I can name all kinds of people. Elizabeth Alexander, who was living in Chicago at the mm-hmm. time, we published, uh, I think, her second book. We've had some amazing... And you know, one good thing about it is that it wasn't uh, a, a, a Latinx... You got next thing. I opened it to everybody because mm. I wanted to publish books that meant something to me. So it's got every race, every ethnicity, every sexual identity you can imagine. We've published Dwight Okita. You know, we published uh, uh, Native Americans. Uh, you know, we put every, everybody, you know, Diane Clancy. I can name you all kinds of people that we published because I was interested in publishing people that weren't necessarily getting published elsewhere, but were also speaking from that heartbeat of that culture that is, gets suppressed and pushed aside that in, includes people of color and includes trans and includes uh, all kinds of people that are not part of that world. So I'm really proud of Theatre Press. We're still at it. And just so you know, the center is Theatre Press, but it's now Centro Cultural because mm-hmm. not only do we do the publishing there, we have a bookstore, we have a performance space, which you were at, yep. we have a, a workshop center. So now it's a whole center. It's Theatre Centro. Uh, that includes the Achucha Press because mm-hmm. we do so much that we teach music, dance, theater, writing. We serve like 20,000 people a year. Uh, we're the only cultural center, art gallery, performance space for half a million people mm. in this part of LA called the Northeast Valley. And uh, it's a very important part because it's the second largest Mexican community in the U.S. after East LA. And uh, it's got some, some of the poorest communities to uh, rattle off working class, all working class people. So I love being in this community. It's my home now. I've been here 20 years. Uh, but uh, the Chucha started in Chicago and carries what I think that uh, Chicago feel, that Chicago feeling of working class speaking out, having poetry, having music, having art come out of their bones. That to me was what made the Chucha a really beautiful, powerful space. So the Guild Complex, by the way, is uh, very much interwoven with that because uh, I, I wanted to emulate what I learned in my time in Chicago. Yo, and, uh, you know, on behalf of myself and behalf of Chicago, we thank you for all the work that you've done in Chicago and nationally to represent uh, our people. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I don't want to hog up all your time. I think I already did, and I'm really sorry. We have, no. some questions, <laughs> we have some questions from the audience. If you would please give us some more of your time. I know there's a lot Absolutely. of audience members on there. Uh, Andrea, if, uh, I believe you had some questions from the audience. Hey there, Luis and uh, Luis Rodriguez. Um, <laughs> actually, I got a question from Carlos Rodriguez. Um, mm-hmm. And he says that uh, you mentioned at the beginning that poetry saved your life. Uh, and you you were showing me the hat earlier. He says, can you have Luis talk a little bit about why he said this? He said, that statement really resonates with me. So would you be okay if I read a poem that explains it? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the yes. poem is from my, my latest poetry book, which is called Borrowed Bones. And uh, the poem is called Favorite Shapes. And it's the first time I ever heard poetry. And by the way, even though I had been writing in juvenile hall and in jails, uh, I wasn't knowing what poetry was. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just writing, which is cool. I love to read, by the way. Books were also important for me. I, I was the, the weird homie that used to bring books to the neighborhood. You know, people said, what's wrong with this guy? But it's okay. That was my thing, books and writing. But I didn't know what poems were. So I went to my first poetry reading in Berkeley. And uh, this is the poem. I was 18 years old. I was on heroin. I had just won an honorable mention in a writing contest. They gave me $250, which in 1973 is a lot of money, especially legal money. You know what I mean? But also, <laughs> I know, but also, I mean, it's like they took me on my first flight. I never was in a plane ever. So I'm going to read you the poem. And it's, um, 
it's about the three poets that I heard that night. Uh, Jose Montoya, which is considered the godfather of Chicano poetry. David Henderson, who was the leading uh, African-American performance poet. And Pedro Piaz, the New York and Puerto Rican poet extraordinaire. All three of them were on the stage at the same time. So it, the poem goes like this. I wallowed in a needle-spawned world, addicted to dope and the crazy life, and yet there I was in Berkeley for my first poetry reading. I was 18 with a bullet, as they say. Earlier, I had flown on a plane for the first time. Sure, I've survived half a dozen gun assaults, cops knocking me around, ODs, blades to my neck in jail cells, homelessness in dank streets and beatdowns in barrio brawls. But flying, that scared me to death. I sat there in a the crowded cafe not knowing what to expect. Poetry, I never heard this before. Oh, I had written lines, vignettes, images, fears, thoughts. I didn't know they were poems. I had no idea what a poem was. First up on the mic was Jose Montoya with Chicano prayers of old pachucos and strained loves and guitar solos in Indian hands and cornflower. Then David Henderson took the stage, gleaning urban black streets, racist stairs, Black Panther fury, and Southern cooking. Finally, Feather Piazza came up. Nyarican wordmeister, flashing at Radio's experiences with poems located in phone booths and real life wisdoms that made us laugh and shake our heads. I had never heard words spoken this way. More music than talk, more fevered shapes than sentences, more Che and Malcolm than Shakespeare. These poems came from me, lassoed my throat, demanded my life savings, taking me for a sunset ride. These poems were graffiti scrawls along the alleys and trash-strewn tunnels of my body, the metaphoric methadone for the heroin hurting through my bloodstream, the lifeline I already had inside and didn't know. These poems were pool sticks, darkened gangways, gangways a sword of sunrise after the graveyard ship, the, a blood black yelling behind torn curtains, a child shrieking and nobody coming to help. These poems were shadowed intense, startled, doubts, sorrows without grief, the moon without sky, unknown melodies, the falling inside that happens when you push razor onto wrist. They came for me as I sank into my suicide while fidgeting in a chair, inching under the, inching under the skin as I wondered why I even came. Jose, David, and Pedro, I was never the same after this. They came for me and I've never let go. They came for me and I've perspired poems ever since. They came for me and all my addictions, my sorry ass lies, my falling mask, my pissed off wives, neglected children, angry friends, and back to back failures could never ever take them away. So poetry saved my life, gave me something to hang on to, a lifeline I had inside that wasn't outside of me. I was a born poet and didn't know it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that that would became, I mean, getting out of heroin was the hard, hardest thing I could do. Poetry was there for that. When I stopped drinking finally 27 years ago in Chicago, poetry was there for that. So I give poetry a lot of credit for giving me that purpose, that meaning, and the, that gift that I have for language, giving it direction and vitality. That's what I, I, I love poetry for. That's an amazing story. And an and, and amazing um, story that those three people were on the stage at the same time. That was meant for you <laughs> to exactly. be there. Yep. Exactly. That was no, meant for you. no accident, no accident. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I wanted to ask you a question because we had a little bit of a chat earlier. How are you doing in these COVID times? I, you know, you're usually an in-demand person and, and traveling across the world. That's one of the things that poetry has done for you, made you uh, a global citizen. So. Yeah. How, how, what happened with COVID when COVID came down? You were telling well, earlier. Uh, I lost a lot of speaking gigs, as you know. Um, and I don't mind telling people the first two months there in COVID, I lost $50,000 worth of gigs. That's painful. Um, and then I also have a play that was a success the year right. before. It was huge. People they extended it. Every weekend was sold out. I had a new theater. We were going to Restage the play, go done. No plays, nothing's going on. Uh, I, I had a lot of setbacks, but I will have to say this. Uh, somehow you find your resiliency, and resiliency is important for all of us. Uh, and that's true for our community. We've got to learn to be 
resilient and keep at it and get stronger. So somehow, believe it or not, I got hit really hard early in April. I got sick. Uh, I got pneumonia. I thought it was COVID. It turned out it wasn't. And then my gallbladder went crazy and I had to get that removed. And then my liver got bad because I've had liver problems for years. It, they, it went real bad. They had to surgically put a drain in there. My liver had it draining out for a while and they finally had surgically had to take it out. But I will tell you that since that time, I'm healthier than I've been in 30 years. I lost 20 pounds. I've been exercising. I've been doing what I used to do when I was a kid. Which I used to be an amateur boxer. So I'm jump roping. I'm 66 years old and years old, and I'm jump roping. Oh, wow. uh, it's been great. It's been wonderful. And I will say that now that with the Zoom calls, the virtual classrooms, my income is picking up. Not like it was before, but I'm not worried about that. I'm doing good. I'm making my bills. You know what I'm saying? I feel bad for the people who can't do that. We were talking about the essential workers, talking about people working cafeterias or cleaning homes or, or, or working in stores. They're all suffering. And, um, and I, I'm not going to complain because I know that right now I'm in good shape. These calls, these kind of events are really happening now. I do like four or five Zoom calls a day practically. So it's it's been good and I'm really glad and I'm going to keep doing it. Hopefully when I, everything gets better, uh, I can get back out there again and join everybody and hug people. You know, I can't, this was something that we talked about in March uh, I know. and it was planned for you to be in Chicago. So I can't wait for you to be back here in Chicago. Yeah. I mean, um, you and David Hernandez um, helped lift the Latino poetry scene in Chicago mm -hmm. single-handedly, um, just the two of you, um, you know, back in the day when we all were at Estelle's and that- We were uh, all so young and beautiful, remember? You're still beautiful. <laughs> you're still beautiful. You still got your looks. <laughs> so, I, but I mean, but that's true. And I think that, you know, as um, Palabra Pura enters its 15th season yeah. next year, um, it's important to acknowledge, you know, the uh, Carlos uh, Cortez's and uh, Carlos Cumpion and yeah. David Hernandez and uh, Eddie Two Rivers who sort of claimed both sides of the fence. And, yeah, he was a good you know, uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and that was so important and it was vital then. And it's important, um, even when I was talking with Luis Tubins, um, to have that that youth. There's, those, there's still people out there. Um, who are keeping uh, Latino literary arts alive. I remember Gregorio Gomez in the firehouse. So yeah. the fact that those things are still out there and they still exist, yeah. I want to say thank you so much for, and I, you know, I found myself snapping my fingers after you were reading, like we were really at the bar. I know. <laughs> it was like, well, uh, yeah, there used to be a lot of bars, a lot of cafes. Yeah, have this, they have this one poem called uh, "Don't Read That Poem," which is about Patricia Smith reading. Because you're sitting in bars, man. And after a while, the drink is overwhelming the poetry. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you get you're not even paying attention what's on stage. But then somebody like Patricia comes up, and there were so many great poets. Knocks you out, wakes you up, man. Sobers you up. There's something about that, that language, that presence. And we had a lot of that in Chicago. And I know David Hernandez and another brother who passed. I uh, have much love for him and his family. Uh, sad, uh, but he was powerful. He was important. He opened up a lot of doors. And uh, he was one of those guys that helped pick up people like me, who, you know, who, who give me the time of day, you know. Uh, Carlos Cumpian as well, very important, uh, helped a lot of people. So I'm really glad you mentioned all that, and I I'm, I'm know that it's moved forward. And then I see that our brother there, Luis Tubins, uh, that means that it's generational, man. The legacy keeps going. That's right. Well, I want to say thank you to Luis Tubins for uh, conducting this interview and being uh, a very good interviewer. I want to also thank uh, Little Lou's Book Club and Sarah Dotson from Make Magazine for having us uh, today. And uh, from the Guild Complex, Luis, you know you're always welcome. Um, looking forward to that. Um, the Guild Complex will be doing their next event on November 12th with Ada Chang. It's Home and Homelessness. Uh, these are all virtual sessions, and I will say the beauty of, of this uh, virtual uh, lifestyle is that you can still be in California and still do your reading, so much appreciated. Um, I don't have anything else to, to say, but thank you to all who joined us this evening, and you have a great evening, and thanks. You. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.